video Meeting number being nine. Recorded. So I want to um, begin today's video by finishing chapter four, and I'm going to do so by uh, talking about one of the more subtle aspects of the pecking order view of corporate finance, um, which is this idea, this prediction, that uh, shareholders, or at least managers acting on behalf of shareholders, should be more likely to issue equity when that equity is overvalued. So this is a textbook asymmetric information situation. The view is that managers have superior information about the corporation. In particular, they may get bad news before the rest of the market does when they get information that uh, things are, may not go so well in the future for the corporation, they realize that as a result today, equity is overvalued because the market does not know that yet. So all else equal, today is a good day to issue equity compared to tomorrow. So if I'm an outside investor and I see a corporation issue equity, there's many things that could cause that. But one of those things is that the managers, based on their superior information, know that equity is overvalued. So I'm going to increase the probability that I put on the possibility that equity is in fact overvalued. That is going to cause me to revise my expectations of the corporation, and that is going to cause the price of equity to go down. So what I want to do is I want to illustrate this uh, fairly subtle idea with a specific example and I'm going to use specifically the uh, exact example that Myers and Majloff used in their original paper. So uh, what they do is they consider a corporation that has assets in place like any corporation and the value of those assets in place tomorrow is either going to be 50 million dollars or 150 million dollars and each of those outcomes are going to happen with probability 50 percent now in, in many ways this feels like the debt overhang example that we worked on because we are looking at a corporation at two different points in time today and tomorrow but the, the context here is completely different. As a matter of fact, this we are looking at a corporation that is completely unlevered. It is an all equity corporation. And in fact, it is going to remain unlevered for the entire uh, duration of the exercise. So that means that this is not a corporation that is concerned about bankruptcy. Bankruptcy is a known issue because it has no debt and it has no payment obligations. So the context is quite different. Um, Another difference, but this one is just for simplifying uh, reasons, uh, Myers and Majloff uh, assume that every investor in their world is risk neutral, so they do not require a premium for taking on risk, and even better, they do not discount the future. So they treat cash flows in the future as the same as cash flows today. So all that means is if you give them an asset to price, all they look at is the expected payoff on that asset, and that's what they're willing to pay for it. So for instance, looking at those assets in place here and assuming new, no new investment, uh, investors would say, well, there's a 50% chance I'm going to get 50 million tomorrow, 50% chance I'm going to get 150 million tomorrow. So the market value of this corporation is going to be a hundred million dollars. So asset pricing is trivial in this world because of the assumptions that we're making here. Okay, but so far we've only talked about the assets in place. And now we're going to assume that there's a new project that becomes available. And this project is going to pay $110 million in the bad state for the corporation tomorrow. And it is going to pay $120 million in the good state for the corporation tomorrow. So, uh, and in addition, the project today if you want to implement that project, you have to put up $100 million in investment today, and that investment has to be, fi be financed with fresh equity. So, as a standalone project, this is a very good project. In a world where people are risk neutral, where they do not discount the future, paying 100 today to either get 110 or 120 tomorrow is a no-brainer, and you would always do it. But Myers and Majloff somewhat surprisingly, are going to build in a world in which sometimes 
the corporation is going to choose to pass on this obviously positive NPV project. So again, this feels like the debt, debt overhang story, but it is going to be very different. The cause, the reason why that's going to happen is going to be very different. Here, the reason is that incumbent shareholders have superior information about the corporation compared to the market. And specifically, whereas the market is only going to discover tomorrow whether assets in place are worth 50 or 150, managers already know it today. So they get information about the future of the corporation ahead of the market. Uh, so I, when they are here at the time of deciding whether or not to make this new investment, they know already whether the corporation is going to be in a good state or in a bad state um, tomorrow. And what Myers and Majlov prove is that in this world, what is going to happen is that it is only the incumbent shareholders or the managers representing them that have bad information about the corporation today that are going to be willing to take on this new project. The um, managers and shareholders that have good information are going to say no. And the reason they, they're going to say no is, look, in order to issue this new, uh, in order to finance this new project today, I have to issue new equity. But I know that uh, the corporation is a good corporation. I know that next period, the uh, everybody is going to know that my corporation is really a good corporation. So that means that today, and I know it, equity is undervalued. Today is today is not a time to issue new equity because the world believes that there's a 50% chance that my corporation is only going to be worth 50 million. Whereas I know that tomorrow it is going to be worth 150 million with probability one. So I do not want to issue new equity today because today is um, uh, is a bad time to issue equity. So let's do the math. Let's actually write that proof of Myers and Majlov. And so this is going to be yet again a proof by contradiction. So we're going to assume by way of contradiction that there is an equilibrium, there is an outcome in this world in which no matter what information my incumbent shareholders and the managers representing them get today, they will choose to invest. So in fact, they invest no matter what. Um, uh, and in particular, even those managers who know that uh, good news are coming, they're still willing to do it. So let's assume that we're true. And of course, we're working towards a contradiction. We're going to show that no, that cannot be true. But if that were true, the value of the corporation today would be this number here. So what is this number? So from the point of view of outside investors and outside investors are deciding what the market value of the corporation is. From their point of view, the value of the corporation is, well, knowing that the project is going to be taken on, either I'm going to get the value of assets in place, 150 plus the payoff on the project, and this is the value of assets in place and the payoff of the project in the good state for the corporation tomorrow. This is the same in the bad state. I get this with probability 50%, this with probability 50%. This means that the market value of the corporation today is going to be 215. And again, this is under the assumption that the project is going to be undertaken no matter what, so that managers taking on this project does not give me new information. And in particular, it does not reveal the information, the superior information that they have about the future of the corporation. Okay. So if that were true, if we were in that world, the market value of the corporation would be 215. Now I have to raise a hundred million dollars in new equity. So I have to issue to sell a hundred million dollars worth of new equity to my new investors. So that means that me, the incumbent shareholder, uh, what am I left with? Well, 215 is the total market value of the corporation. I have to give away 100. So my share is this number here, 215 minus uh, 100, which is 115 divided by 215. So this is the consequence of issuing new equity for me, the um, the incumbent shareholder. This is dilution. Whereas I, had, I owned 100% of the corporation before. Now I only owned a, uh, a smaller fraction of the corporation. Okay. So now, again, this is under the assumption that the project is undertaken no matter what. But now we're going to get a contradiction. And the contradiction is 
we're going to say given this dilution in fact incumbents who have good news are better off not investing so how uh, and why is that so well let's assume that i do not um invest if i do not invest since i have good news i know that i'm going to get 150 next period it's all mine i own 100 percent of it because i do not invest if i do invest the good news is that the payoff on my asset the value of those assets is going to be 270 that's 150 plus 120 but i only get this fraction of the 270 and if you do the math you will find that that's what i get if i do not invest and I just satisfy myself with the assets in place, but I own 100% of them in place is bigger than what I get if I do invest. So the problem and the intuition is that this is too much dilution. This is too much dilution to justify the investment. And why is this too much dilution? That's because the market is only valuing the corporation at a market value of 215. Why? Because the market, unlike me, they believe that there's a 50% chance that the corporation is going to be bad tomorrow. But I know that the true value of the corporation is 270. In other words, I am in a situation today, given my superior information, where I know that the corporation is undervalued, that the, the equity is undervalued. So that means that to finance the new project, I have to dilute my share way, way, way too much. And since I dilute it too much, uh, I'm better off just not issuing equity today because today is not the right time to do it because equity is severely uh, undervalued in this case. So that's it. So I, I know this is quite subtle, so you will find in my extra notes all the words uh, in writing that I uh, try to do on this video here. And this is uh, an example that's really cool. So I, I really encourage you to study it, this example of Myers and Majlov. But again, this is this idea that if um, when I observe a corporation raising new equity, as an outside investor, one of my inference is going to be, well, it may very well be the case that the corporation knows that it's a good time to issue equity. Why is it a good time to issue equity? It's because uh, I happen to know that equity today is overvalued. And so this is one of the key parts of the pecking order view of corporate finance. And with that, I'm going to stop uh, talking about um, Capital structure, this is going to be the end of this chapter. So normally when we do this class in person, I follow this up with a conversation with uh, the entire class about how treasurers uh, and people in corporate finance in practice manage their capital structure. One of the key points that we've made in this chapter is that there is an ideal target capital structure for a given co corporation. So that invites two questions. How do corporations decide what that target is and how do they make sure that they remain on target? So I'm not going to do this here. Obviously, we cannot have this in-person um, conversation, but uh, this is something that I'm perfectly willing to do during office hours. This is going to be yet another tease to kind of get you to come talk to me uh, during office hours. And if time permits, maybe I'll turn this, what we normally say during this um, conversation into a few slides. Uh, but short of that, I would ad advise you at this point to, uh, you know, look around on the internet for uh, how do treasurers manage capital structure. Uh, and what you will find is that the practical side of this is actually very intuitive and very, very simple. Basically, the short summary is that treasurers are going to set financial ratio targets for themselves and again that leaves two questions open how do they set those targets where do they come from and two how do they manage those targets on a uh, on a year two year basis how do they manage to stay on targets how much are they willing to deviate from those targets and why and so on and so forth again please come talk to me during office hours and uh, we could get into the details of this but for now that is all i'm going to say about chapter 4 and i'm going to move into the next topic which is Uh, let me open my next 
chapter, the next topic is going to be payout policy. So here we go. So, so far we've talked about the two biggest questions in corporate finance. That's the capital budget budgeting question and the optimal capital structure uh, question. Next in line is payout policy. So what is payout policy about? Um, so it starts from a very simple observation, which is that uh, at the end of any accounting period, the corporation is going to generate free cash flows to equity. Those are cash flows which in principle are available for distribution to equity holders. So those cash flows are either going to be retained they're going to add to the cash position of the corporation or they're going to be distributed. So this entire chapter is about uh, uh, what the options of the corporations are, whether when should it retain, when should it distribute, how should it distribute, etc., etc. So to start with an, uh, a very simple observation, if you are a corporation with a lot of investment opportunities, good investment opportunities, lots of positive NPV projects for you to consider and take on. The right thing to do is probably to retain most of your free cash flows. And again, all we have to do to convince ourselves of that is go back to the pecking order view of the world, which is that obviously the cheapest source of funds is the funds that you already have, the funds that you have generated yourself. If you know you're going to invest, it just doesn't make any sense to return chunks of money to your outside stakeholders only to ask them uh, for uh, more money down the road. Um, so that round trip here would be costly and it would be a waste of time. Now, this is what we expect from uh, corporations with a lot of positive NPV projects, and hopefully that's most uh, uh, of uh, most that's that's the case most of the time for the corporations that you're looking at. But there are exceptions to even this uh, obvious rules. Uh, obvious uh, uh, rule. First of all, for some corporations, it is not um, uh, legal for them to retain their entire cash flows to equity. So for instance, real estate investment trusts, which we have already discussed, have an obligation, a legal obligation, to distribute 90% of their income. So obviously, if you are one such corporation, you are going to distribute regardless of what your uh, investment opportunities are. Uh, another reason to distribute dividends, regardless of what your uh, um, growth opportunities look like is you may be a corporation whose shareholders have a strict preference for dividends. So to understand this, you have to imagine a world in which some investors, say older people that need regular and predictable financial income, only want to invest in corporations that are going to write them a distribution on a regular and predictable basis. So if we live in such a world, what we should see in equilibrium is corporations that um, distribute dividends match with investors that enjoy those dividends. Invent investors that enjoy and need those dividends are going to be willing to pay a higher price for those dividends, which is good for the corporation. So. Let's imagine that we have corporations out there that maybe are stable corporations, their investment needs are not that great, so already for them, the cost of distributing is not that high. And meanwhile, we have those investors that love those dividends, then it's it's a match made in heaven. Those investors are gonna pay a premium for the equity of those corporations in equilibrium compared to what other investors would be willing to pay. And we would in fact see in equilibrium corporations and investors matching in this fashion. So this is what we call the clientele effect. It may be that your shareholders have a distinct taste for dividends. Another reason why investors may have a taste uh, for dividends is the so-called bird in the hand view. When I generate cash for my equity holders and I do not distribute my cash immediately to those equity holders. What I am telling them is that you're not getting that cash today, but that's because I have good investment opportunities today and you're going to get that cash in the form of capital gains in the future. Well, if you are an investor who's very averse about uh, future gains compared to today, so if you have a strong bias towards the present, this is the bird in the hand 
idea, then uh, this is something that you're going to dislike. And again, you're going to gravitate towards corporations that distribute dividends. And we would have an equilibrium where some corporations distribute a lot of dividends because some shareholders like dividends and prefer a lot of dividends. And this is what would happen in equilibrium. And one of the final reasons why we do see most corporations uh, pay frequent and predictable dividends is once again asymmetric information. So remember that um, managers of a corporation have superior information about that corporation. So that means that they know more about the prospects of the corporation. They have they know whether the corporation is healthy or not better than outside investors do, but they also have better idea about how the cash is really being used inside a corporation, etc., etc., which gives them opportunities to misbehave um, uh, uh, from the point of view of shareholders. So a corporation, therefore, may choose to issue dividends on a regular basis out of fear that if it did not do so, the shareholders, the outside investors would think, well, perhaps those managers are concerned about something. Maybe they know they need to keep their cash. And uh, this is why uh, uh, they are choosing not to pay too high a dividend in this period. And so it would send the message that perhaps there is something wrong with this corporation. So very simply, this is why you see very, very seldom corporations cut dividends. Dividend cuts are extremely rare in practice. If you've paid 50 cents in dividend last quarter, you're going to be very reluctant to go anywhere below 50 cents this quarter, because again, there's a risk that investors could take it as bad news. Um, and then on the uh, topic of misbehaving, which is another uh, issue associated with asymmetric information, the other reason to pay regular dividends is it does not leave too much cash around. So this goes back to the Jensen free cash flow idea that we discussed in the previous chapter. If there's too much cash laying around, managers are going to tend to enjoy perks. They may engage in empire building and all that, um, uh, uh, all those actions that are detrimental to shareholders. Okay, very good. So th those are the big high level ideas when it comes to uh, payout policy. But now let's look at uh, uh, a couple of practical considerations. So first, practical consideration number one, how do corporations distribute in practice? So they do it in two ways, uh, mostly either by paying dividends or by buying back shares. We will prove in the next video that if you are not a tax shareholder, dividends and buybacks are completely equivalent. But of course, if you happen to be a taxed investor, they are not completely equivalent. Uh, buybacks are a way for corporations to return money to me, which, on, which is not taxed, unlike dividends. And having observed this, the question then becomes, why would a corporation pay dividends when it can use the buyback route uh, instead, which would have less tax consequences on investors? And so this is something that we'll discuss uh, in the next video. Very good. So now let's talk about the practical implementation of dividends. The fact is that in practice, uh, the most common way of distributing cash back to investors. And that remains true today, even though, as you know, buybacks have become very fashionable. Still, dividends are, remain the most common way of returning cash to uh, So how does it work? So a dividend distribution is going to be a, uh, a play in four stages. First, there's going to be an announcement. So the first date is the declaration of the announcement or the announcement date. This is where the board of directors of a corporation announces that a distribution is going to be made. When it does so, it also announces a payment date. That's the date at which investors are going to receive the money and it announces a record date. So this is the date at which an investor has to be recorded uh, as a shareholder of the corporation to receive the dividends. So the corporation's ledger has to show that a particular individual or institution is an investor on that particular date in order to um, receive the dividend. Now, of course, 
most uh, shares trade in exchanges and what happens is when a share is traded in an, in an exchange the exchange has to let the corporation know that uh, the um, uh, that, that ownership of the corporation has changed effectively so this is why exchanges are going to set what is probably the most important date when it comes to dividend, the so-called X dividend date. And that X dividend date is going to be typically two business days before the record date. And if you want to qualify for uh, a dividend, you have to be uh, an owner of the corporation on the day before. The, you have to own the share, you have to purchase the share on the day and you have to own it by the day before the X dividend date. So if put another way, if the purchase is made on or after the X dividend date, then you do not qualify for the dividend. So this is the date that most investors try to keep in mind that if they do want the dividend, the dividend they have to be uh, an owner at the close of the uh, uh, day before the X dividend date. Okay, so more practical considerations. Uh, dividends uh, come in four basic types. First, the most obvious is the cash dividend. So this is where uh, the payment is drawn from the cash account uh, of the corporation. And of course, a cash dividend is going to be treated by tax authorities in most countries as income, and it is going to be taxed, therefore, as income. In the United States, uh, there are two types of cash dividends. Uh, they are div Cash dividends are either qualified or not qualified. If they are qualified, which is most dividends paid in the United States, then the tax rate is going to be a lower tax rate. It's going to be a tax rate, which is basically the capital gains tax rate instead of being the ordinary income tax rate for an individual. If it is not qualified, then a dividend is going to be taxed at your ordinary income tax rate. So one example of dividends that are not qualified, and that's a very important example, is the dividends paid by real estate investment trusts. Those are not qualified dividends. So the good news is you do get a lot of those dividends and they come on a frequent and predictable basis, but you are taxed at a higher rate than you are for most other corporations in the United States. Okay, so those are cash dividends. Uh, not at, and by far, cash dividends are the most common type of dividend. Another type of dividend is the stock dividend. So how does that work? Instead of getting $100 in cash, I'm getting $100 worth of stocks. So put another way, basically what the company is telling me is before you had one stock, now you're going to have one and a half shares or you're going to have two shares. So once you put it this way, you realize immediately that a stock dividend, the payment of a dividend in stocks, in pieces of papers, in shares, in physical shares, is exactly like a stock split. What is a stock split? A stock split is all of a sudden, for reasons we don't fully understand, a corporation will say, well, you had one share before. Now, if you had one share before, you have two shares. So I'm basically multiplying the total number of shares by two. I'm changing, all I'm doing is I'm changing the unit of account. If I had one share worth $100 before, obviously now I have two shares worth $50 before. I've just multiplied the number of pieces of paper. Um, so anyway, long story short, a stock dividend is exactly like a stock split. But then you wonder, why on earth would you pay a stock dividend? Just like one wonders, why on earth would you do a stock split? Uh, what is the point of a stock dividend? So I'll give you a specific example of uh, the most recent case where that happened in the United States. So this was after the 2008 financial crisis. And again, the key corporations affected by this were real estate investment trusts. So remember that real estate investment trusts have to distribute 90% of their net income as dividends. But in 2008, real estate in investment trusts, for obvious reasons, were in bad shape. In fact, they were on the brink, uh, for most of them, of going out of business because they could not face the, their payment obligation. So what the government did in March of 2009 is they passed a law saying that REITs, as a one-time exception, were allowed to pay dividends as a stock dividend rather than as a cash 
dividend. Of course, a stock dividend comes at zero cost to a corporation. So basically what the government did is they said no dividend, no dividend requirement in March 2009, and that helped rates uh, recover from the crisis. Another type of dividend is the uh, so-called property dividend that's rare in the United States, but that's when instead of giving you cash, I'm giving you goods and tangible things. Uh, I'm told this is very common in Japan, for instance. Uh, and as an example, Japanese airlines often give to their shareholders vouchers and discounts and the like. And obviously that's taxed as income because it is income. It is giving shareholders uh, a valuable object. As I said, extremely rare uh, in the United States, though it, it, it does happen. And then finally, and uh, also quite rare, is the so-called liquidation dividend. So a liquidation dividend is an exceptional dividend paid by a corporation when it needs to liquidate assets. And that typically happens in bankruptcy and uh, or, or when a corporation simply wants to go out of business for a normal uh, reason, say the owner is retiring and uh, um, and there's nobody to replace them. Um, so you, you're going to liquidate your assets and a dividend is going to be paid for to shareholders if there's any money left after you pay your debt holders. And, um, uh, and the, the big advantage of treating it as a liquidation dividend is that it's not going to be taxed as income anyway, but obviously you can imagine that there are big restrictions on the use of liquidation dividends. The bottom line is cash dividends are by far the most common type of dividend. So let us look at some um, examples of uh, dividend policies. So let's go to a corporation, which is one of those corporations that pay high and regular dividends. And that corporation is Caterpillar. Um, and we're going to look at Caterpillar's dividend history, and we're going to go directly to the company's website, if I can find it, caterpillar.com, dividend history, so here we go. And so this is the dividend history, the recent dividend history of uh, Caterpillar. So for instance, on uh, just a week ago, on the 8th of April, Caterpillar announced that it would pay on May 20th, a dividend of a dollar and three cents, which by the way, that was big news because as you can see, this is exactly the same as the previous dividend. And so the market, this was good news to see that Caterpillar felt so good about themselves in spite of the current crisis that they would be uh, able to hold the line. So this is the perfect example of, in my opinion, paying dividend because not doing so would send the wrong message. I am not so sure that all else equal Caterpillar would not be better off holding on to their cash given the current uncertainty, but they made a point of telling the world that yes, we're going to go and we're going to pay a dividend, not, our, not just a dividend, but the same dividend, high dividend as we've been paying. So the record date for the corporation is uh, the 20th of April, so that means that basically you have to purchase the share on uh, uh, on an exchange two business days before this, and we're going to look at uh, details uh, about this for a moment. But let us also look at a dividend that was already paid, like um, the one that was announced on December 11th, record date, let's remember that, January 21st. And again, the size of that dividend is of that dividend is a dollar and three cents. So before uh, we go look at the impact of that payment that was made on uh, February 20th by Caterpillar. Let us look at the pattern of Caterpillar's dividend history. If I look at the pattern, what I see are a number of things. Let me start with the obvious. First of all, Caterpillar does pay dividends. Every quarter it pays dividends. And again, the reason for why that's kind of puzzling for most of us economists is there are ways in which it could do this, presumably like buybacks that would have less tax implications. And not to mention the fact that perhaps Caterpillar would be better off holding on to their cash unless they've run out of uh, project of, of, of investment ideas. But the fact is that Caterpillar, like most corporations, pays uh, dividends all the time. So that's fact number one, that's obvious. Two, 
dividends tend to be sticky. As I said, when you see a number, that number tends to persist. And it's not just that every calendar year, the dividend is the same, which I guess could be explained away easily. You see periods sometimes of two full years where the dividend is the same. And you can see that that goes back, that goes way back. So for instance, here, Caterpillar for almost two years paid 42 cents by way of dividend. So this is the way we describe this is we say dividends are sticky. And for us, that's even more puzzling. Why would it be the case that a dividend that made some sense two years ago is once again exactly the same dividend that makes sense today? Whatever fundamentally drives Caterpillar to choose a dividend, its circumstances must have changed so much in the span of two years. Why does Caterpillar have this tendency to stick to the same dividend quarter in, quarter out for many, many quarters in a row? And again, we do not have a good theory for this in corporate finance, but the most likely theory we have is one of based on asymmetric information. That Caterpillar, by sticking to the same dividend, is telling the world that everything is okay. I am not messing around with the cash that is yours. I'm in a shape that is good enough to continue paying my dividends. And that gives uh, the status quo a lot of momentum. All right, so dividends are sticky. And another thing that you can see is they go up. They do not, or very, very seldom do they go down. I don't think there is any instance here, here of dividends going down, which again is kind of surprising companies do go through ups and downs. So it should be the case that dividends likewise go uh, up and down. But this is this speaks to the reluctance that corporations have to lower their dividend. Okay, good. But for now, let, let's play with uh, some more with the negative the, um, uh, mechanics of dividends. And in particular, we're going to look at the most recent dividend paid by Caterpillar, which is this dollar and three cents that was announced on December 11. And let's remember that the um, record date is uh, January 21st. So with the record date of January 21st, it should be that the X dividend date, the date uh, past which you would not qualify for that particular dividend. It should be about two business days before this. So let's see whether that's the case or not. So let's look at our X dividend date for Caterpillar. And here we go. The X dividend date is January 17. So that makes sense. That makes sense. So now let's look at um, the impact of this X dividend date on uh, on the stock price of Caterpillar. So let's go to our Yahoo Finance Caterpillar data. And I'm going to look at historical data. Uh, okay, this is daily data. I'm going to, I'm waiting here for an opportunity to download those data. Here it comes. Let me download those data. So this is my stock price information. Waiting for the data to come up. I'm going to close. Okay, and I'm going to make this nice and big. Very good. I'm only going to keep the two series that I care about. You remember, I do not care about any of this, so gone it is. I only care about the close and the adjusted close. Remember that I like to sort my data, 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 sort from by, I want to sort them by date, and I want the newest date on top. So good. So we have the regular, the true, the actual price series for Caterpillar. This is the, what you have to pay today if you want to own Caterpillar. And this is the adjusted price series. You remember from previous chapters, so that what is the adjusted price series? It's a very convenient series because I can look at that price series and pretend that Caterpillar never pays any dividend and that it never has a stock split either, even though that's less of a concern now since we see very few stock splits in the data um, anymore. So 
where that helps me is if I'm trying to calculate the return on owning Caterpillar and Caterpillar pays dividends, then I have to worry both about capital gains and the distributions uh, that I'm getting. But with the adjusted series, no problem. It's as if Caterpillar never paid any dividends and I can just look at the change in the that price series and it's going to capture my entire gain associated with owning Caterpillar during those various um, periods. So that means that any difference between the true series and the adjusted series comes from dividend. If there's no dividend paid, those two are going to be the same. And so if you look at adjusted versus close and you look at the most recent data available, it is always going to be the case that adjusted and the true series are the same, unless on that exact day uh, there was a dividend. Paid. Okay, so if I want to find out when a dividend was allocated to my shareholders, all I have to do is find basically the first time or one of those times where those two series are different. So I'm going to look, I'm going to let Excel tell me when do you see differences between the close and the adjusted close. So I'm going to use an if statement here and I'm going to say if the close is equal to the adjusted close, then don't tell me anything. Open clo quote, close quote. I don't need, this is a non-event. Nothing happened here. But if you do see a difference, then tell me when that is. Because probably something interesting happened here. Okay. So there we go. This is kind of brutish, but it's going to get the job done for us. And so let's look at the first time Oh, there we go. So this is the first time that uh, I see a difference between the adjusted series and the raw series. So I'm, this is good. The first time is here. I found it. And of course, I just looked it up. This is my X dividend date, January 17. So what that means is if I buy the stock Right uh, on January 17 or later, I am no longer entitled to that one dollar and three cents dividend. But here, so at the close of the day before the ex dividend date, I see a gap. What is that gap? So let me measure the size of that gap. That gap is exactly the size of the dividend. So that kind of makes sense, right? That kind of makes sense in the, the following sense that here, if I have this Ross theory and I buy it at the close, I am entitled to a dollar and three dividend. But in this fictional world in which um, uh, the, no dividend is distributed, I am not getting this dollar and three cents. So that this is the right adjustment kind of makes sense intuitively, but let's verify that it does really formally um, make sense. So what does it, what would it mean for it to make sense? Remember that, how do I want to use this series here, this adjusted series? I want to be able to close my eyes and pretend that no dividend was paid here. So that means that my gain associated with say buying here the day before the ex dividend date and selling on the ex, at the close of the ex dividend date, the gain has to be equal to the same as it would be if I bought at the actual price, got my dividends, or at least my entitlement to the dividend, and sold here. Okay, so let's compute those two gains. So first, I'm going to do the, the gain as we did when uh, we did our CAPM model. According to the adjusted price series, the gain associated with buying Caterpillar here on the day, at the close of the day before the ex-dividend date, and selling over here, that gain, since again, I'm pretending no dividend in the adjusted case, simply is gain divided by base. Okay, so that is my gain. Let me format it as a percent. Okay, good. Now let me do the same using the actual series. So if I do the same using the actual series, what am I going to get tomorrow? I'm going to get this number here. That's the price at which I'm going to sell at the close of the X dividend date. But I got this dividend because I was, I bought at the close on the previous day. So I qualified for this, uh, for this dividend minus the cost of this strategy, which is this guy divided 
by the cost of my strategy. Okay, so that's the return, the true return that I'm getting. So those two here are supposed to give me the same answer. I said the adjusted series is constructed, this fictional series is constructed in such a way that I don't need to worry about dividends. When I look at the rate of change in the adjusted series, I get the same return as I do using the real data. But that's not the case here. So why is that not the case? Well, that's because we've made a mistake in this um, calculation. And the mistake we've made is that I forgot that if I get a dividend here, and technically, let's be precise, this is an entitlement to a dividend, which is going to be paid, I guess, three weeks later. But a promise to receive a cash flow a, um, uh, a month later is something that I could turn into cash. I could just sell that promise to somebody else in the market for exactly that same amount. So it's as if I had gotten a, a cash distribution already of one dollar and three cents. Well, then if I do have one dollar and three cents, I get to invest it. And I get to invest it here, for instance, by buying a little bit more Caterpillar and selling it there. So what is the return to that strategy? Well, if the adjusted series is correct, the return to that strategy is going to be the ratio between what my adjusted price is tomorrow and what it is today. Okay. So all I have done here, the only way in which I have adjusted this formula is I've recognized that when I get the distribution of a dollar and three cents, I get to invest it today and I get to enjoy any capital gains appreciation associated with Caterpillar. And now when I do this, I get exactly the right number. Okay. So that in fact, creating a gap at the close on the day before the ex dividend date is doing exactly what I want, which is creating a fictional series, which is going to give me exactly the right rate of return, recognizing the fact that if I get a dividend distribution today, I could, if I wanted to, immediately reinvest it in the stock. Okay, so that's the adjustment. If we want to create the adjusted uh, series, uh, all I want to do is uh, uh, create a gap on the day before the X dividend day. And then the question is, what do I do with the rest of the series? Everything before the dividend. And the answer here is going to be, uh, once again, very simple. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say, what is the ratio on the day before the uh, X dividend date? What is the ratio between the adjusted series and the raw Oops, let me calculate this. What is the ratio between the adjusted and the raw series? So this is, uh, let me format it as a number with two decimals. This is what we call the discount rate. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to apply the same discount rate to the entire series. So in fact, let me verify that this is true. If I do the same discount rate, I get, uh, if I do the same ratio, I get the same discount rate. So this discount rate that I get here, I'm just going to apply that discount rate to the entire series before. Why? Because this is going to keep um, this number proportional to this number throughout until yet another dividend is created. So I'm going to stop talking about this here. More importantly, at the beginning of my next video, I'm going to show you how I turn all this stuff into an exam question, something which you're probably interested in. But for now, I will stop talking.